بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week we went over an important topic to uh, kind of introduce the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that was looking at the situation of the Arabs uh, in Arabia prior to him coming sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so we looked at the kind of life that existed in Arabia and that's why it was referred to as the days of Jahiliyyah the pre-Islamic times and how there was a need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a messenger uh, at this particular time in history now when the writers of Sirah they begin discussing the family background of the Prophet ﷺ, which is what we want to do today. They usually start with the story of Ibrahim السلام, and how he left Hajar, his wife, and her newborn son Ismail in the valley of Mecca. And so this is where we start on the journey of looking at the family background of the Prophet wasallam. And so tonight we have several different stories to cover, starting from then, coming all the way to, coming all the way to before the birth of the Prophet wasallam. So we're talking about several centuries, and in fact, uh, millennia between the time of Ismail and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're talking about thousands of years. And so we start with the origins and we start with the story of Ismail Alayhi Salam. And so uh, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, he takes his wife and their newborn son to Hijaz. And so Ibrahim السلام, was not from Arabia. He was not from uh, Hijaz, but rather he was from Iraq. And so he had two wives. He had Sarah and he had Hajar. From Sarah, he had Ishaq السلام, and from Hajar, he had Ismail. السلام. So he takes them to present day Mecca, and at that time, it was a dead valley. There was nothing there. However, the location was always sacred. This particular place where the Kaaba will eventually be built by Ibrahim and Ismail, it was a sacred land. It was a sacred place. Now, there is a difference of opinion among the scholars as to who first built the Kaaba. And so, some mention that it was Adam alayhi salam, while many mention that it was Ibrahim alayhi salam. Either way, either way, the location was always uh, a sacred location since the day that Allah created the world. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam left his wife and his son Ismail there, along with some water and a bag of dates. And then he started to walk away. And Hajar, she knew that Ibrahim السلام, was going to leave them there. But she did not know that he would leave them. He did not, she did not expect that he would leave them in such a place in the middle of the desert. 
where they have nothing. And so she started to follow him. And she asked him, O Ibrahim, are you going to leave us in this place, in this valley, where there's no cultivation, and there is no one living here? And so Ibrahim السلام, did not respond. She asked him again, and she didn't get an answer. She asked him a third time, and again, no answer. Then she said, she asked, Allahu amaraka bihada. Is it Allah who told you to do this, O Ibrahim? And so Ibrahim السلام, said yes. And so that was all she wanted to hear. That answer was sufficient of an answer for her. And so when she heard that, she said, In that case, Allah will not abandon us. Allah will not neglect us. We are taken care of. And so, it shows you her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though, you know, all odds are against her and against her survival. In terms of material standards, no human being could survive uh, in such a place, let alone a woman with uh, with a, a newborn child. And so Ibrahim السلام, left, but when he reached the outskirts, uh, a place where you know, uh, she could not see him anymore, he turned around and faced the direction of the Kaaba and made dua. And this dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the ayat that we recited in, in Salat al-Isha, in Surah Ibrahim. In Surah Ibrahim, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbana, inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri dhi zar'in inda baytika al-muharram. Rabbana liuqimu salah, faj'al afidat al-nasi tahwi ilayhim urzuqhum min al-thamrati la'allahum yashkurun. That, oh Allah, I have left my family in this barren valley that doesn't have any vegetation, no cultivation. So let them to establish Salah. Look at how his main concern was worshipping Allah. His main concern was not, Oh Allah, provide for them with food and drink. He mentions that after. He mentions that after. وَرَزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ You know, provide for them of fruits. But he mentions first, لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ I have left them here for them to establish Salah. And then he he makes that dua, and then he leaves them. Uh, he leaves them there. Now, Hajar makes use of the small amount of water and dates that she has, but obviously, it's not enough. And so soon, whatever she had ran out. And so she was breastfeeding her son Ismail. And eventually, without, without food, without drink, uh, you know, uh, her milk was going to dry out. And that's exactly what happened. And so Ismail, alayhi salam, he starts to cry out of hunger. And so Hajar, she could not bear that anymore, seeing her child in pain. And so she went in search of food. And so she started to climb a nearby hill, this hill will later on be referred to and called Safa, Mount Safa. And so she looks to her right, to her left, when she gets on top of the hill, seeing if she could see any food, if she can see any people. And so when she cannot see anything, she climbs down. And then when she reaches the middle of the valley, she starts to uh, run. And then she makes it to the next hill, which will later on be called Marwa. And she got, climbs on top of Marwa, and here she looks around again, looking for food or a sign of people. And when she cannot see any, she comes down doing the same thing 
until she reaches Mount Safa. And so she does this seven times. She does this seven times. On the seventh time, when she reaches the top of Marwa, all of a sudden she hears a sound. And she looks around her for the source of this sound. And to her amazement, she sees that the sound was basically water gushing forth from beneath the feet of her son Ismail alayhi salam. And so this is when Jibreel alayhi salam came and dug the well of Zamzam. And so the, the water is now gushing forth beneath his, from beneath his feet. And Hajar came and, you know, uh, she didn't want this. She didn't want this water to, uh, to, to dry out or, you know, to go to waste. And so she thought that if she just leaves it, it'll, you know, uh, it'll go away. And so she starts to make it into a pool. She starts to gra gather the sound around it, the, the sand around it, and she made it into a pool. And this is how, this is how it became a well. This is how Zamzam became a well. And so it stayed in that place, becoming a well. And so the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this. And so he said, May Allah have mercy on the mother of Ismail. If she had left the water alone, if she did not do that, then it would have become a flowing river. It would have become a flowing river or a spring in which the water flows on the surface of the earth. Now, what was Hajar feeling when she was running up and down these two hills? Now for us, we all know the story and we knew what was going to happen next. But she had no idea what was going to happen. She did put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the sign of the true believer. But even then, the true believer, even after putting their trust in Allah, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of them. And so, she must have been broken. She must have been crying because of the pain, the suffering that she's seeing uh, of her son in front of her own eyes. And so this was her test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah had hidden, Allah had hidden for her something that would happen. And imagine right beneath his two feet, right beneath his two feet. She would never have imagined that this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take care of them. Not only that, but she would never have imagined that hundreds of years later, in fact, thousands of years later, people would be following in her footsteps until the Day of Judgment. And so the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that this is the reason why in the Umrah or in the Hajj we make Sa'i running between or walking between these two mountains, Mount Safa and Marwa. And so the lesson we learned from this is we need to realize that, you know, in, in, in difficult situations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us to see who will, who will we be attached to. Will we attach ourselves to Allah or will we attach ourselves to others? Or will we lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so it's a test for us. It's also a test of our patience. And so when going through difficult situations, let us remember this story of Hajar and how she put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually provided uh, her with something far better. 
Now, we finally have water in this barren valley. And in the desert, water is a source of life. It attracts not only human beings, but animals. And so, soon enough, there were birds hovering above above the well of Zamzam. And so, a tribe that had migrated from Yemen were nearby. And this tribe was the tribe of Jurhum. The tribe of Jurhum. And they were familiar with the area of Mecca. And they were familiar, they knew, that there was nothing in this area. There is no water, there is no vegetation. And so when they saw these birds hovering above that area, they became curious, what's going on? So they sent two men to go and investigate. And so these two men, they went, they saw what was there. And so they came back with the news of this well and this woman with her child. So, this tribe of Jurhum, they decided now to come and to settle in this place because now we have a source of water, which is important in the desert. So they came and they asked Hajar, can we settle in this place? And so she responded and she said, if you want to stay, I have a condition. And that is that this water belongs to me. You can come, you can live here, but the water is ours. And so she being a lonely woman with no protection whatsoever, she's negotiating, even though you know she's in a position of weakness. But she negotiated with them and they agreed. They agreed. So now Ismail alayhi salam, he grows up among this tribe, which has now settled in Mecca. And so this is the beginning of Mecca in terms of it being an inhabited city. And so Ismail alayhi salam grows up among this Arab tribe. And remember, Ismail and his mother are not Arabs. They are from Iraq. They speak a different language. But now Ismail alayhi salam, growing up among them, he learns their customs, their heritage, and he learns their language. And so this is where the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam begins. Ismail alayhi salam, grows up and he becomes a man and he eventually marries from this tribe. Now we fast forward, and so Jurhum, this tribe, remained in Mecca for almost 2,000 years. And they were basically managing over the affairs of Mecca, while the descendants of Ismail السلام, were managing the religious aspects of Mecca. So they had, remember, they had Zamzam. They're taking care of, you know, whoever comes to Mecca. Uh, they're k taking care of all the religious matters. But Jurham and their descendants, they are managing in terms of being the rulers of, of Mecca. But now, after hundreds of years, 2,000 years, uh, Jurham, they become tyrannical and they become corrupt so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends another tribe to annihilate them and so this other tribe they are Khuza'a they come in and they invade Mecca and they get rid of Jurham but before Jurham leave they do two things 
they dump the well of Zamzam, they cover it up, and they erase any trace of it, any sign of, of the well of Zamzam. And they steal the treasures of the Kaaba. So by now the Kaaba was built. It was built by Ismail and Ibrahim السلام, And it used to be a place where they would keep treasures in. So they steal its treasures. And then they leave. Now Khuza'a, they become the de facto leaders of Mecca. While the descendants of Ismail by that time had already increased in number, branched out and spread all over Arabia. The descendants of Ismail. However, there is one branch of their descendants who remain in Mecca. And they eventually be referred to as the tribe of Quraysh. They eventually be referred to as the tribe of Quraysh. And so, Quraysh is the tribe in Mecca from the descendants of Ismail and you have this other tribe the tribe of Khuza' who is ruling over Mecca now last week we mentioned an individual who was from this tribe who was that individual we mentioned a very important figure who played a huge role in changing the religion of the Arabs. Because as we can see, Ismail preached the message of Tawheed. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be worshipped alone. But how is it that they ended up worshipping idols? This was because of an individual by the name of Amr ibn Luhay from this tribe of Khuza'a. He was one of their leaders. And we mentioned his story last week, how he is the one who introduced idol worship. Now we fast forward several hundreds of years, and we come to an individual by the name of Qusay ibn Kilab. He is from Quraysh, one of the descendants of Ismail Qusay ibn Kilab, he becomes the leader of Quraysh. And he manages to unify Quraysh against Khuza'a. Which they did. And they ended up, they ended up taking control of Mecca. Complete control. So now, all of the affairs of Mecca are under Quraysh, having complete control, governing the city, having control of not only the religious affairs, like taking care of the pilgrims, looking after the Kaaba, but also heading what was known as the Nadwa, which is basically like the assembly or like the parliament. Also being the flag bearers, and so complete control was now in the hands of Quraysh. It was done by this leader of Quraysh by the name of Qusay ibn Kilab. Now, when Qusay passes away, he passes on these roles to his children. So now, the different roles that he had, he passed them on to his children and they were distributed. So, you know, one of them had control of, or one of them was responsible for the Kaaba. One was responsible for uh, finances, etc. Now, initially, they used to have a particular way of feeding the pilgrims by giving them bread and drink, etc. But Amr, he invented a new way of feeding them, and that was by taking the bread and crushing it and mixing it with soup. So now we have crushed bread, 
mixed with soup. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because in the Arabic language, doing this, crushing bread, is known as hasham. Hasham. So Amr, because he innovated this new way of feeding the pilgrims, he ended up being known as Hashim. He ended up becoming known as Hashim. And he is who? Who is Hashim? Hashim is basically the great grandfather of the Prophet. So now you could see we're getting close to the Prophet. Hashim was also the first one to start uh, the journey that Quraysh used to make, one in the summer and one in the winter, that Allah mentions in Surah Quraysh. لِإِلَافِ Quraysh, إِلَافِهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ والصيف. So, in the summer they would travel to Syria for trade, and in the winter they would travel south to Yemen. And so he was the one who started this. Now Hashem eventually he goes on to get married, but not from Mecca. He travels to Yathrib, which later on becomes known as Medina. He travels to Yathrib, and that is where he gets married. So he gets married, and he leaves behind his wife and continues his journey uh, north to Syria. So basically, he leaves Mecca, travels north, to Yathrib, gets married there, leaves his wife, and continues his travel north to Syria for, for business. However, he eventually passes away on this journey. And so he dies in Gaza, and that's where he gets buried. But he ends up leaving behind a pregnant wife in Yathrib. Eventually, she delivers a baby. And this baby, she, she names him Shayba. Now, in the Arabic language, Shayba means an old man. Why does she name a child an old man? It's because at the time of his birth, he had some gray hair. So, she ends up calling him, giving him the name of Shayba. So Shayba is the son of Hashim. So eventually Shayba he grows up in Medina, in Yathrib, with his mother and uh, and his relatives from the side of his mother. One day, a man comes into Yathrib from Mecca, from Quraysh by the name of Al-Muttalib by the name of Al-Muttalib and he is the brother of Hashim he is the brother of Hashim so he is the uncle of this boy he is the uncle of this boy Shayba why does he come? he comes to claim his nephew he comes to claim his nephew and so he, he tells them, I need to take him back to Mecca. And so initially they refused. But then he convinced them, he said, look, he comes from a noble family and he needs to go back to learn his heritage and his culture and to start to assume his responsibilities. Because the responsibilities are you know, divided among the sons of Qusay. So you had Hashim, and now you have, you have this boy by the name of Shayba. So eventually they agreed to let him go. And so Al-Muttalib, he enters Mecca with this child, Shayba, that no one had ever seen before. And in those days, slavery was common you would go to the market and buy a slave. And slaves were usually young boys because you would buy them and then you would train them 
uh, to work as slaves. So he enters Mecca with this boy that no one had ever seen before from the people of Mecca. And so they assumed that this must be the slave of Al-Muttalib. He just bought him. So they end up referring to him as this child. They end up referring to him as Abd al-Muttalib. They end up ret- referring to the child as Abd al-Muttalib, the slave of al-Muttalib. And so, who was Abd al-Muttalib? He was. He was who? The grandfather, the grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so his real name was Shayba. Now, we have some important, uh, we have some important events to mention uh, from the life of from the life of Abd al-Muttalib, and so there are a few stories that we're going to mention, and these are important key events that took place that uh, we should w- we should cover insha'Allah ta'ala. The first incident was the digging up of, of the well of Zamzam. Now remember that the well of Zamzam had disappeared. It had disappeared for 300 plus years because Jurhum, before they left, they, 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 they sacked the well and they dumped it and they got rid of any, any trace that there is a well here. But Quraysh, they're familiar. They know that there is some well because the tradition passed on and they know that there was a well that was... You know, they know the story of Ismail uh, and what happened and how a well was here once upon a time. And so, Abd al-Muttalib, Abd al-Muttalib, uh, he sees a dream one day. And so someone comes to him and says, dig Taiba." And so, Abd al-Muttalib, in his dream, he responds, he says, what is Taiba?" And so he doesn't hear a response. And that was the end of the dream. So the following night, he hears a similar voice in the dream. And now he is being told, dig the precious. He says, what is it? What is precious? He doesn't hear anything back. And the dream comes to an end. The third night, a voice calls out to him and says to him, Dig Zamzam. He responds, What is, you know, what is Zamzam? And so the voice responds, Zamzam, it will never fail, it will never dry up. It will water the, the grand pilgrims. And it lies between the dung and the blood next to the nest of a crow with the white leg and the ant's nest. So Abdul Muttalib, he wakes up in the morning and, you know, he's confused. He is unable to decode any of these symbols. And so he goes to the Kaaba in the morning and all of a sudden he notices certain things. He sees dung and blood from a camel that was slaughtered the night before. And, you know, it was just left, the intestines were just left there, and so he notices dung and blood. And then he sees a crow with a white leg in the same area. And then he also notices a colony of ants. So now, the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. The symbols that he saw in his dream, that were mentioned to him, He's seeing them. So Abdul Muttalib, he said to himself, this is where the well of Zamzam must be. And so he calls his son Harith, 
and they start digging. He calls his son Harith and they start digging. Now, the well of Zamzam, it's not too far from the Kaaba, only a few meters away. And so the people, they start to notice and they ask, what are you doing? What are you digging next to the Kaaba? What are you looking for? And so without answering them, the two of them, the father and the son, they continue digging. And so they protest, but Abdul Muttalib and his son, they don't listen, and then they continue. And then eventually they leave them. You know, the rest of the members of, of Quraysh, they leave them. The two of them are digging until finally Abdul Muttalib, he cries out and he praises Allah. And so the people, they come rushing and to their amazement, they find that Abdul Muttalib had uncovered the well of Zamzam. And so all of the leaders of Quraysh came and said, yes, we know what this is. This was the well of our grandfather Ismail. And we are all the descendants of Ismail. And so we all have a right to this well. And so Abdul Muttalib said, no, it was me. I was the one who saw the dream and I was the one who uncovered it. And so it belongs to me and me alone. And so they refused saying that, you know, they're all the descendants of Ismail, so it belongs to all of them. But Abdul Muttalib refused. And so they went back and forth. They got into a dispute and they didn't know how to resolve their dispute. So someone suggested, let us resolve our dispute by going to a certain sorcerer, a certain witch, who used to basically, uh, you know, resolve disputes. And so she was a witch who used to be in contact with the jinn. And they said, let us go to her. So it turned out that she had traveled to Syria. And so they said, okay, let's travel. And so they traveled. And on the way, they ran out of water. And so in the middle of the desert, Abdul Muttalib tells them that, look, if we are all going to die here, then we might as well dig our own graves. And so whenever one of us dies, the rest of, the rest of us can come in, cover, cover him and, you know, uh, bury him instead of all of us dying, you know, without getting buried. So they all dug their graves and they were waiting inside of their graves, waiting for death. So then Abdul Muttalib, he said, no, this is not right. For men like us to wait for death, let us do something. Let us go and search for water. And so they agreed and they went in different directions to search for water. After a short while, Abdul Muttalib, he finds water. And he comes to them and he says, he says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you, in this desert and provided for you water and Allah showed me the dream to uncover Zamzam then surely this must be an indication this must be an indication and so they all said to him that this is a sign that Zamzam belongs to you and so they said we give up our claim and let us go back so they go back to Mecca now when the whole incident happened and they pressured Abdul Muttalib to share the well of Zamzam, Abdul Muttalib felt weak because he only had one son to defend him. And so in tribal societies, in tribal societies, uh, your strength is usually based on how many men you have. And so you could count on your sons the most and so Abdul Muttalib Abdul Muttalib he makes a promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he comes back to Mecca he makes a vow and so he says oh Allah if you grant me 10 sons 
then I will sacrifice one of them for your sake. And so that is exactly what ends up happening. Allah blesses Abdul Muttalib with 10 sons and six daughters. So now it comes time for him to, to fulfill his vow and sacrifice. He said, I will sacrifice for you, O Allah, if you give me, if you give me 10 sons. So what they used to do, Quraysh and the Arabs, they would go to their idol and they would have these arrows that they thought were divine. And so they would they would cast they would cast uh, arrows in the direction of of their idol. And for, for Quraysh it was their idol Hubal. And so what was the sacrifice supposed to be? He was supposed to sacrifice his son, the tenth son. He was supposed to sacrifice his tenth son, which was which was Abdullah. So Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, was supposed to be sacrificed. So basically, Abdul Muttalib, he goes to, you know, cast these uh, arrows. So basically, basically, these arrows, he lines up his sons, his ten sons, and he casts these he casts an arrow and he throws it basically every time he throws it it points to who it points to abdullah his son abdullah and he does it several times and so after doing it so many times it's clear that i have to sacrifice this son and no other son and so he goes to the Kaaba and he gets ready to sacrifice his son Abdullah. And so one of the elder sons of Abdul Muttalib, he comes to his father and he was who? Abu Talib. Abu Talib comes to his father Abdul Muttalib and says, Look, we cannot allow you to kill your son. And so other people joined and said, we're not going to let you do this. Because if you do this, then it will become a sunnah. That's what the Arabs will, will end up doing. Every time they have 10 sons, they will sacrifice one of their sons. And so it will become a trend after you. So Abdul Muttalib, he said, this was the pledge that I made to Allah and I cannot give it up. And so this now ended up in another dispute. So, once again they decided to go to the witch. Once again they decided to go to the witch. So, they went to her and this time she says, Okay, let me get back to you. I'm going to go and consult my, uh, my jinn, the spirits. And so the next day they came back and she had an answer for Abdul Muttalib. And so she said, she asked them, what is, the, what is the retribution, the blood money that a person pays when someone is killed, when someone is murdered? What is the penalty? What is the blood money? And so they said, it is 10 camels. They said, it is 10 camels. So she said, put 10 camels on one side and put your son Abdullah on the other and then cast arrows. If the arrow points towards the camels, then slaughter the camels. But if it points towards Abdullah, then add another 10 camels. And so they agreed and they went back and they did exactly as the witch told them. And so the arrow ended up pointing towards Abdullah. And so they added 10 more camels. They cast the arrow again. It pointed again to, to Abdullah. And they kept on doing this 
until they had now a hundred camels. And now, finally, after, you know, we have a hundred camels, he, he, he draws the arrows again, he draws the arrow, and finally now it points towards the camels. And so the people, they said, finally, okay, release your son now. But Abdul Muttalib said, no, let me do it again. And so he did it again, and again, and again, and it kept on pointing towards the camels. So they finally ended up slaughtering and sacrificing the 100 camels. And who paid for it all? Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib paid for it all. Uh, and he was known to be a very generous man. And so there was so much meat left that, you know, even after the people took all the meat, there was still so much uh, that was left that it fed the birds and the beasts and whatnot. And so that's why later on uh, it became known among the Arabs that Abdul Muttalib is the one who fed humans as well as the animals. And the people, they were right when they said to Abdul Muttalib, don't do it, do not sacrifice your son because it will become a trend, the people will follow you. And so when he sacrificed a hundred camels, the blood money now, it changed from 10 to 100. And so, the Arabs followed this new tradition now. And, you know, in fact, this was a tradition that continued even after Islam came. And so, uh, in Islam, until today, for someone who kills someone, the blood money is 100 camels or in terms of currency nowadays, which is around 140 or 150 thousand dollars. So later on, the parents of the Prophet ﷺ, who are basically Abdullah uh, and Amina, uh, later on Amina, uh, she mentions to the Prophet ﷺ that you are the son of the two who are about to get sacrificed. Who are they? Abdullah and the second? Ismail. Who something similar happened with him as we know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exchanged him for the ram that Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, sacrificed. And so this is the story of uh, this is the story of Abdul Muttalib and how he discovered uh, the well of Zamzam and also the story of him uh, about to sacrifice his son Abdullah and how he eventually survived. And so in his survival was the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so imagine if Abdul Muttalib had sacrificed him, uh, you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would not have been alive. And so all of these events were precursors to the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ. All of these events are being planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this sequence, one after the other. And so there is one more event that uh, we would like to cover, insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, as we mentioned, we had two important uh, events in the life of Abdul Muttalib. The second event, we will insha'Allah ta'ala uh, cover uh, next week, bi'idhnillah. And so, uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, today's uh, session. Uh, سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وصل اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته